Good afternoon and welcome to The Take Up. Today we have episode 145, Stitch Tights, Shape and Settings. What can we control? All right, folks, welcome into The Take Up. Happy to have you guys in here. Happy to be back after an extended uh, I would call it a vacation, but it wasn't much of a vacation to uh, be out on the road teaching and then suddenly be kind of ill and not doing so great. So what I'm going to be honest with you guys about is I am not fully at 100% right now. I would love to tell you I'm at 100%, but I am not. We'll call it a uh, solid 85%, and hopefully I'm, I'll be good enough to get you guys going, to get you where you need to be, and to help you learn a little bit today. But for sure, I am not back at 100%, but I am back and here and happy to be with you guys. So suffice it to say, if I make it a little bit shorter show, if I run out of steam, if I'm a little off my game, please do uh, give me a little bit of space today. I, I apologize for being kind of out as long as I was, but I am here and back and ready to teach. First thing I'm going to say is thank you to all of you who came out to the DAX show in uh, Kansas City. What I'm going to also inform you of is if you want to see more of the kind of content that you're going to see today, if you are looking for more on maybe intermediate digitizing. I am coming again out to the DAX shows. DAX show is happening in Minnesota at the end of this month, 30th and 31st. I am teaching on the 30th. I'm doing a long session that is about the kind of stuff we're talking about here, going beyond the basics and at least discussing more than just, hey, what is digitizing? What is it that we can control? What is it that we can do to get the effects that we want out of our digitizing. And that's what I'm talking about coming up at the end of this month. So that's coming up. And then after that, another two weeks out again, will be Tinley Park in the Chicagoland area. And I will be out teaching again. So uh, teaching, traveling, coming back on, I will be back here with more content. And in fact, before we get going on the main matter of the content today, I wanted to say, if you are a reader, if you're someone who likes to read posts, who likes to see a little bit of text in your feeds, then I do have something good for you, at least right now. Today, I have a new post over at ericampbell.com. I kind of resurrected the blog while I was a little too sick to do much else. I went ahead and wrote a new blog post while I couldn't go live. So... If you want to get into that, there is actually something to check out on the front page. You'll find it down there as well as in the blog pages. We have a little piece on pricing and embroidery digitizing. So it's not for everybody, but if you're somebody who's at all going to uh, sell your digitizing, sell anything of that nature, you may find it uh, educational to check this out. Go ahead and add it to the stream. So if that's something you're interested in or just the concept of how you price embroidery digitizing at all is interesting to you, over at ericampbell.com, you will find this. Uh, pricing and Brady Digitizing, three theories. Nice short piece where I talk about different ways you might go about pricing. Uh, and the three that I cover are uh, stitch count pricing, flat rate pricing, complexity pricing. And then I talk about the hybrid approach that I used to use. It's kind of the minimum plus complexity. It's something that I've used before and that is useful to me. So if that's something you want to check out, go ahead and go over to ericcampbell.com. You will find it there specifically. There's ericcampbell.com or right here, pricing and royalty digitizing three theories. That's the long one, but who cares? Go to ericcampbell.com. It is right on the front page and you will find it right underneath the main banner. You'll find that that latest post as usual. So before we get in, I just thought, hey, there's something else to get there. I will try and keep up some posts as well. So if you're somebody who's doing digitizing, that might be something you want to look at. There's other posts that are there in the blog that have been there before, but I'm going to try and do some of the stuff that we've done. Um, both things that end up in the articles, I love doing stuff for like Images Magazine out in the UK, uh, doing some stuff for impressions, doing some stuff for Graphics Pro, but not enough of that is getting to everybody because not everybody's seeing these things. I'm going to try and get some of that stuff into the blog so that some of the stuff that's out there, especially like in Images UK, I love, their, love the publication, but a lot of people stateside are not seeing those publications, which I am in every single month. Uh, I'm going to try and get some of that on the blogs so that we can get you guys in and able to read that stuff locally in a digital format that makes sense for you. But also I'll refer back to the original post so that the good people that out of the Images UK get the link love for that stuff as well. And if you like their magazine style formatting and flipping through it, then you can do that too. I know I used to like the flip book magazines and I still like those. So it's something you can check out as well. But for today, go check that out. Uh, Pricing and Digitizing Three Theories is out on the blog posts as of now. All right. So I'm going to say hi to a few of you folks before I get into the actual uh, text of this matter to get into the actual presentation of stitch types and what we can control. But I want to say hi because we love having you guys here. Reciprocators are in force and saying hi. Uh, Kingsbury Crash says, Eric, hi. <laughs> 
I assume you're saying hi, Eric, and I'll, I'll take it. Uh, Frank from out in the UK, good evening. Thank you, Frank, for always being an awesome promoter. Ramona says, good to see you back. Good to be back. Trista says, hi. Hi, Trista. Cindy is in. Hi, Cindy. Frank's on both sides. Thank you, Frank, for being here <laughs> from all different channels, my friend. Uh, Jarita is in, doing great work. Jarita, glad to see you in. Uh, we got lots of folks in. Ramona is also saying this woo woo written written wisdom. Woo woo written wisdom. That is hard to say all together from Eric. Nice. Yep, more coming. And Lena says, morning, morning. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Lena, for being in. And hi, Debbie. Happy to have you in as well. As I always say, guys, derail me. If there's something you really want to talk about, throw it in the comments. I might not catch it immediately, but I can always catch it toward the end. But here's the thing. Let's bring back up that uh, thumbnail image. What was I going to talk about today? Hey, this is it. Stitch types, shape, and settings. We can see a bunch of random stuff that is out there uh, that I'm showing you. You've got uh, elements from some of my previous classes. I've got the tiger piece that I often show. I've got one of my earliest blends ever. That little star with the flames on it is from a, a casino called Santa Ana Star. And boy, did I ever struggle with that thing. Um, the K blend that you guys have seen where I talk about manual blending, feather stitches on that ostrich feather. We've got the we've got the Hanya mask up in the upper left-hand corner. All sorts of weird different stuff. Honestly, sometimes when I put these together, these channel caps aren't all that are cracked up to be. I put that stuff up there so you can get an idea of the kind of weird things we're going to talk about. But the thing is, ultimately, when we talk about what we can control about stitches, it gets to be a lot more than settings. Why did I call it shape as well? Why did I put shape in there? Because the truth of the matter is when we are getting to digitizing and interpreting art into stitches, which is what we do, ultimately, I think it's fair to bring it up repeatedly. We are interpreting a two-dimensional thing into a three-dimensional thing. We are more like sculptors than we are like painters. We are making a three-dimensional object out of thread. We're building it layer by layer. It's fair to say. When we're doing that, a lot of what we do isn't represented just in stitch types or in settings. And that's the thing. I talk about variables and I'm going to talk about those today. However, as we get into the concept of interpretation, as we get into the concept of how we make the effects that we make, I want to make it clear repeatedly that what we draw, how we break up a design is as critical, if not more critical in a lot of situations. Uh, as the settings, as the way we put things together in software, as the dials and sliders and buttons and numbers underneath each of our stitch types. As you guys know, because it's something that I talk about frequently, I there really is only one stitch in embroidery. <laughs> because of the machines we have, we have an interlock sewing machine, a glorified sewing machine that also happens to have a pantograph that moves. And so we have essentially one stitch. We have a single point to point line of a solid thickness of the thickness of thread. And all we can do with that one stitch is arrange it in different ways. Now, does that mean stitch types don't exist? Not really. Uh, it doesn't mean stitch types don't exist because they're in our software. It is a useful parlance. It explains how we are interacting with stitches, how we make marks, how we fill areas with color and with texture. All of those things are useful to us. We should discuss them. But we should never forget that ultimately, the only thing we really have is the manual stitch, but we have software that allows us to fill areas with these stitches in a set pattern according to rules that makes it a lot faster for us to fill these areas, for us to draw these shapes. But ultimately, the stitch is the same stitch all over the place. Uh, hence why, as much as everybody makes the joke about my old <laughs> my old stock design site where I don't sell a whole lot of stuff, uh, I am adding some more stuff to it. But here's all the old stuff that's been there forever. Why do I call this thing the only stitch? Well, I call it the only stitch because that's the only stitch we can make. We can make one line from point to point that is of one color generally. Now we have the idea that we can dye thread on, on the fly, but unless you got a color reel, you're not doing that today. Um, maybe you have a variegated thread and that can make a difference. But like some of the pieces I show are actually here from that design setup. The thing is, we have to remember that ultimately we are building things out of individual lines of thread of a single thickness of a single color that we arrange together. And the reason why I'm kind of stressing that is because I want you to remember that despite the fact that we have stitch types and we have settings and we have all of these uh, variables that we're used to talking about, Ultimately, with the manual stitch tool or with combinations of stitch tools, we can do whatever we want to do with those stitches. We can combine them in ways that don't seem immediately uh, available to us just because we're looking at a shape, especially like say you're taking a piece of vector, you're converting it, you're putting it into your software and you're taking that one shape that looks like one solid block of color 
and trying to add a stitch type to it, fairly frequently what we really need to be doing is breaking it up into several separate shapes and addressing those with different stitch types, different stitch treatments, even if it looks like one contiguous area of thread. And that's not even just to do what I always call dimensional carving, which is taking something that's like a silhouette and carving it into individual minute pieces so that we get extra texture that's not there in the art. That is something that I like to do to increase the texture, to increase the variability and the visual impact of the piece. It's also sometimes just what we need to do to render a shape. Um, one of the ones that I think about frequently, and I don't have one queued up right this second to show you, I can show you something similar, is when we have something like paint that has drips or a paint stroke where the edge is feathered, but it's at the end of a satin stitch where the, the block that we're looking at, the stripe that we're looking at makes sense as a satin stitch. Though it looks like it's one piece, we might want to go in and take our manual stitches or our straight stitch tool and draw those little ragged edges as a block by themselves and then put our satin stitch over the top and have that little feathered edge sticking out. It Even though that is one swipe of paint in our art, it is on us to create the texture that we want. It is on us to break it up into multiple shapes. And a part of that process is what we draw. It's not just, here is a block of color, here's a stitch type, here are some settings. That is the flood fill coloring book method of digitizing. And if we want to get past that, if we want to get to doing something that has a little more visual impact, that has some texture, we have to realize that one solid block of color in our art does not mean and probably should not be one block of stitches, one uniform block of stitches of one type in our software. So I know that is like a lot of soapbox stuff to say. So like I said, it's a lot of me saying, yeah, we're going to talk about stitch types, uh, but we're also going to talk about a lot more than stitch types. <laughs> this is gonna, it's like, yes, that is something we're going to talk about, but here's the big parenthetical, but we're also going to talk about the other things we do as far as interpretation to make that happen. So that's one of those things I just want to make clear to you guys that even though I'm talking about stitch types and I'm going to talk about different things we can do with them. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're going to break things up into separate pieces. And the great thing is this, we have total control, but it also means we kind of have total responsibility. The thing that I talk, that I actually have said to people before about manual stitching, right? Manual stitching being dropping one point to another point and every stitch you click, right? That is the manual stitch, the basic building block to everything we've ever done. How digitizing used to be done back when it was called punching. Every individual stitch was dropped one at a time, right? Well, the great thing about manual stitches is total control. <laughs> what, what can we do is that every single one, we talk about what can you configure, Let's talk about manual stitches as if it's something you can configure. There are no settings to a manual stitch aside from perhaps, perhaps a maximum stitch length that's probably set in some filters in your software. Otherwise, there are no settings. However, what can we control? Everything. Every stitch that we take can be in any angle that we want. It can be any length that we want. So it has the most control. We can arrange it in density. Remember this too. Density is not just a measurement that's on the back end of your fill stitches and satin stitches. Density is also just how close together any lines of stitching are. That includes lines that we are drawing with our manual stitch or our straight stitch tool. We have total control. The problem with manual uh, stitching is we also have total responsibility. Every single stitch we have to control. <laughs> we have to place every single one. So it's incredibly slow. However, manual stitches are how we get certain very detailed looks. It is how we can end up with uh, incredible control over even things like color blending. Like I said before, that one piece that I, I showed you guys, and I'm going to bring it back up again, uh, the gradient fill, the gradient fill K, which is one of one of the pieces everybody kind of points out whenever I have it as a sample uh, on a sample table. We've got a couple different versions of the old gradient fill K here. Um, how is it possible to get a multicolor blend in this small space? And you can see my thumb sitting on top of it. You see how small it is, as, as immense as my thumb is. Um, how do we get a blend to look like this where we're going from purple to yellow in, you know, like a less than two inch space? Well, one of the ways we can do that is through manual stitching. The thing is, it means total control, but total responsibility over everything. And as you can see with this piece, um, it does fill. In, a, in such a way that gives it that total control. It layers down into one layer of stitching across the whole piece, but it means that I dropped every single one of these manually. And in fact, because we're talking about this, I will go ahead and lean into this real quickly and we'll go ahead and show you this thing in software just so you can see it one more time, kind of what I'm talking about. Um, manual stitches are where it all begins. So we can start from there and then we'll get into stitch types. We'll get into the kind of stuff that you expect to see when we talk about stitch types. But let's just talk about this manual control for once. 
Do we get this incredible blend? Yes, we do. Every single stitch was dropped manually, which means that if we isolate uh, any one of these colors, what we can see is that it was done drawn one line at a time, which means I could not rely on settings. Now we have this, the background fill and we have one piece of fill involved, everything else. These, these lines were dropped uh, one at a time, one stitch at a time. And what I'm gonna show you is if we zoom in on this piece, cause everybody wants to know kind of how this is done or how this was done, this particular piece. This is something that I wouldn't suggest for every client cause it's incredibly time consuming. But what you can see is when we're zoomed in really tight, we can zoom out and you can see down over here by my head in the corner, that what we have is uh, we are skipping. Here's one skip and then three on, one off, three on. Then we go back down. It starts to go uh, two on, two on, one uh, every other one. And then it starts to go further and further spaced out. And when we start to blend in the next color, you see that each one of those lines fills in exactly until we get one solid density of 0.4 or four embroidery points across the entire fill. And if we turn on our stitch points on this thing, what you're also going to notice is that I dropped those stitches in a very regular way that makes them look like a standard fill. However, this is not a fill stitch. You can call it a fill stitch and you can say it's a fill stitch, but in the common parlance of what we talk about with embroidery software these days, um, this is not a fill stitch. Why is it not a fill stitch? Even though it looks like a fill, acts like a fill, you know, quacks like a duck, everything you might expect. Why is this thing not a fill stitch? Because it was entered manually one stitch at a time. <laughs> total control, total responsibility. That's how the manual stitch works, but it lets us do anything we want to do with it. Plus it, it does have some other things we can do. This is actually one of the, the uses that I usually wouldn't do. Um, this is incredibly time consuming. That is not something everybody wants to do or probably should do. However, it does show you that anything you want to do is possible. Any stitch you see you can make if you want to take the time to make it. The chances are, however, that this is not a reasonable thing for most of us to do for uh, a given design, depending on how many of those pieces we're going to make. If I were doing this for a, a streetwear brand that's going to make thousands upon thousands of these things, I would absolutely punch it manually if I had to, because I'm going to be making thousands and thousands of pieces. I only have to make the file once. That makes sense. If I'm making 10 pieces, I'm going to have to charge an awful lot for this file. <laughs> I'm going to have to charge an awful lot of this for this file because I can't amortize it over a ton of pieces. The thing to understand about control here, though, is that control often comes with, like I said, responsibility or time or having something being time consuming. So it's great that we have stitch types to work with. It is something to understand that the more control we take over it, the more we want to draw our own shapes to make something work, the more control we can get, the more we can do with our stitches, even our normal stitch types. And like I said before, it's not always about doing things manually. In fact, a lot of the work I've done, in fact, some of the, some of the work that people really like from me uh, happens to be stuff that is not done manually, happens to be stuff that, uh, frankly, I've worked as hard as I can to not do every single piece of it manually. <laughs> uh, if you guys have seen like the, the jumping mouse design that I've done where it's blended uh, blended fills to create a fur texture, but I only did a little bit of manual work to break up the outlines. Most of the work I did commercially was trying not to do that much manual labor. However, there's an amount of manual labor that really makes things pop, that makes things work in a better way. So one of the things I want to say is like, hey, think about stitch types, but also think about what the shapes you draw can do to have an effect on what you're doing. So I got a couple of comments here before we get going into the next part of this. We're going to get into the actual list of like stitch types and things we can control to kind of get back off of just me getting on the, on the uh, soapbox and telling you, hey, how you draw your shapes makes a difference and what you can do is what you want to do and how much time you want to take. But let's talk about a couple of things after that. We'll say hi to some people ahead of time though. Uh, Adelina came in. Adelina, thanks for being here. Love to have you here. Letty says hi to everybody. It's awesome. TMG Customs in. Hey, happy, happy to have you in. Thanks for watching, tuning in live. Lisa, awesome digitizer in her own way who teaches incredible classes. You should go see her stuff. She's up just at... Uh, everything embroidery market. Happy to be watching the take up a bit of normal. Yeah, me too. Happy to be here. <laughs> and Ramona's still working to get some normal. Got it. Lisa says it's on us to create the interest in our stitches. True. Yeah. Big time. Uh, we can create or not as much texture as we want to. We can work on different things that are not just stitch types. And the thing is we can use the types and tools we have to make other things. You guys know, if you've seen me talk about motifs, I use custom motifs to do things that are not standard stitch types all the time. You guys saw the uh, the piece that I did. If you go back a few episodes, we talk about doing the rough custom. It's very like the faux chenille look, 
That is all done with custom motifs, and it's off the book if you want to say that much. It's not a traditional use of motif stitches. The thing is, if we understand what each stitch is, what the only stitch is, and we understand what we can change about stitch types, we can then recombine them in novel ways to make things that are not the traditional way of using them, or at least not what people expect when they look at stitch types and blocks. Big time. Dorita says, never thought of that. Ragged edges under the edge of the satin. Absolutely. Uh, the jagged edges don't make sense as satin pieces all the time. So sometimes we add distress by doing something ragged under the edge before we run it. Same thing with fill stitches. Uh, same thing with blending on, on fur. We sometimes have to do some raggedness before we add the other pieces. And like I said previously, um, I'm not always trying to add more work. This piece here, and I'm going to bring it back up because it's one that everybody has seen of mine before. Uh, the jumping mouse for Bosque de Apache. This particular piece, there's only a little bit of manual stitching. All of the rest, the back of this haunch, this is a, it was in a software that had a double curve fill called a Florentine. So this backside does have a double curve. That's not in every software. Um, you won't find that in, uh, in Stitch Artists, but Stitch Artists have a single curve, which would be just fine for this. You do a single curve fill. The rest of these are single curve fills. There's a couple of different fills of two different colors of brown in here. There's a little bit of manual stitching that's done in what we some people call like a vermicelli stitch. It, all it is is just wormy. That's all that means. We're just going back and forth across it to break up the outlines. But even the dark shading here, these are open, loose fills on top of each other, layer by layer, that build up. And I've only done a little bit of manual stitching to break up the lines of the fill stitch because what I know is people recognize a fill stitch by the regularity of the lines they're in regularly spaced lines at a density are how you see the fact that that is a fill and that it looks mechanical. If I use manual stitching, which I did to break up the edges and to make some of the darker areas, and it's just a little bit of manual stitching in each one of these pieces, it's enough to tell your brain this thing is done manually, that it looks like handwork, that it looks like somebody worked and worked at it to make it work. The thing is, it is not of the same level as someone who is doing, you know, incredible levels of, of manual stitching. In fact, I will go ahead and run this for you because it's not something I, I was planning on doing, but it's one of those things just to make that clear since I decided to make this point. We'll go ahead and play this back for you. This is the little jumping mouse that you just looked at. So we can kind of see it here. We've got our stitch, stitch portions all put together. And there's, there's the original art. If you want to see that too, we'll go ahead and zoom out so you can see the original art. There's our original art that we worked from, pretty rough art. We also worked for some from some photographs so that we could work from that and, and uh, make all of our <laughs> our people at the uh, the wildlife preserve happy who know a little bit too much about these mice. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at this piece. We're just going to scrub our way through it so you can see what I'm talking about. So we start out with these layers of ivory. Here's the legs done in a satin stitch. Why do we use satin? Because it's nice and smooth. It gives us a smooth finish for those legs, which are not supposed to be fuzzy and furry. We have some randomized feathered edges on this underneath fill. We have a fairly standard fill for the stomach, but it does have randomized stitch lengths because we can change the length and the pattern of fills. Um, then we build up. We've got the underside of the body and the nose and some satins. We have the ears done with a satin edge for texture. So that's two different pieces to make up the inner portion of the ear. Then we start doing this brown. There's some manual stitch there. What is that? That's our jagged edge that we set manually underneath the fill that's going to be there. Because the fill, especially on the edge of the fill that is the open end of that fill, the fill, the curve that is part of this curve fill cannot be jagged because it is the edge, is the, the side of the fill, if you want to call it that, where we have the stitches across. It's not the stitch angle, it's the perpendicular. So I had to do something to break that up. I used some manual. Then... Loose fill, and this one does have an underlay because it's the base layer. Got a second curved fill for the back. Those two curves provide contrast. What are the things that we can change? Contrast. So there's the contrast between these with using different stitch angles and curves. We do see I've used feathering on that fill to get a jagged edge on the back. So there's a feathered edge with some extension. And then we get into the face. We've got another curve. So we've changed angle. There's contrast between each of the three parts of the body contrast between them shows you that they are different. So that's one of the things we can change. When we have adjacent pieces of fill stitch, we change the fill between each one and we make it follow the pattern of the body or of the object we're working on and splitting it apart the way we draw changes the effect and how it looks. Then you see there's a little bit of manual stitching that's shading in that brown around the eye so that we eventually have a little bit darker ragged edge around the eye. We have a little bit of shading on the top of the arm. 
And then we have this fill once again, that is jagged on the back. It's got a nice feathered edge for the top of the arm. Then we're coming back and look at this. That is a fill stitch, same angles, but we are using a uh, different minimum stitch lengths. And we've left this area open because we're letting that brown and that ivory from the original piece show through, right? So we're letting a little tiny bit of the ivory show through, but this is a fill stitch. What is it? It's a loose density fill stitch that has a feathered edge. That's all that is. We are not doing hitting manual yet in this particular part of the shading. There's this shading too, but once we get up here, there's a little bit of manual stitch that's done around the eye and up into the ear, but it is very fill-like. What else do we notice about this? The angles are at the same angle from layer to layer. Why? So that the stitches will fall into each other. If the angles match between two layers of stitches, they will fall into each other and blend. If they do not match, then they're like underlay and the, the thread underneath will hold up the thread on top. So as the angles match and mesh, we end up with a lighter shading that feathers in. Then we're seeing some manual work around the face to keep this nice and ragged. So we have that fur type texture. Then we do some outlining. So there's some outlining, fully normal outlining. And you'll see I've done some shading in the middle of that. So I've used my straight stitch out that I was using the outline to also do shading. Got our nice little whiskers. And then we see the outline around the eye that is manually set up. And then we see manual shading across the top of the face, across the top of the head, into the ear. This is fairly manual as well across the back edge to separate the head from the neck. And then you see this, this is where we get into manual stitching. There's what I call that vermicelli stitch. It's just me going back in little curls that break the angle. All these little curls and patterns break the angle and make it more fur-like and manual looking. We also use manual stitching around the back edge. We have a nice dark little line here to separate the body in this panel kind of here with this body section into the haunch. And then we have another fill in the back. It's just another fill with randomness in the length and some feathering on both sides. And then we manually do the last part of the shading around the body and finish the outline. So how much of that was manually placed? Not a tremendous amount. Most of that was fill, but because we've done enough manual work that offsets it, that breaks up those lines, we end up with a look that is much more like a manual setup and it breaks up all of those lines, even though originally if we back up past that, that fill stage, we go back past that manual stage. We can see all those textures coming together, but look at that. How much more does this look like fill stitch than it does when we add a little bit of manual on top? So <laughs> even though that wasn't the primary thing I was going to talk about today, um, that control, that little bit of manual work can often make a big difference as to what the final outlook is. The thing is understanding what the character of the piece is helps us to control what it eventually looks like. Knowing the character of the stitches themselves and how to adjust it and what an individual stitch does and how it looks like and what the settings mean, what the variables do, allows us to make more out of what is already there. It allows us to make more out of what we're looking at and of the settings that we do use. So I think it's useful. It's a useful thing to think about. It's a useful thing to kind of consider that uh, stitch types and settings aren't the end all be all. But let's talk briefly about like what we can control. And I'm gonna show you some of the stuff that we're gonna talk about um, is actually from the current class I'm teaching. I'm not going to, of course, teach you the entirety of the paid class I'm doing with DAX. I, I don't, <laughs> I try not to do that while I'm still teaching the classes. I am gonna talk a little bit about what is part of this three hour, you know, three and a half hour extravaganza that I do at DAX. But we are just gonna talk briefly about the things we can control. And I'm just gonna list some things out for us to understand as we get eventually into more of the stitch type stuff. So what can we control? What are the things that we have control over as digitizers that are going to make an effect that are going to help out or alter the final look of our pieces? What are the things that we can control? So let's start with the things that are in interpretation, right? Interpretation is when we look at a piece of art, uh, very much like our little mouse friend here. When we look at a piece of art and then we had to decide what about this original art are we going to change and interpret? How are we going to take what we're looking at here and maybe whatever resources or photographs we have and make this into something else? Uh, what can we change? What is it What is it about our interpretation that we can work on? Well, the, one of the big things I always talk about, of course, is shape or carving. Shape and carving, the ability to break up or parse uh, your stitches into multiple elements. That is something that you can control. It is something you get the kind of uh, control over in general. 
so that you are able to take a piece and break it up into multiple shapes. And some of it is uh, in a decorative way and some of it is not. Some of it is just to make sure that things work for the proper stitch types. Some of it is not. Um, if we're talking about, because here's a, a very basic example. Uh, you guys have seen this one before and I'll go ahead and take this off here. This is a piece for Zozobra that I did, the burning of Zozobra where we have the big, uh, it's like a big effigy that gets burned every year in Santa Fe. The thing that's interesting about this is this is done in that uh, silhouette carving style. It was originally one big black slab with nothing else in it. You can see that I've elected to carve multiple pieces out so that the flames are made out of a lot of turning and uh, satin stitches and auto split or length limit satins, as well as some curved fills and satin stitches that highlight uh, facial features, the fingers and the hands, the cuffs, uh, the bow tie, the belt. These are all features that are on the piece, but were not present in the art. That's one of the things we can do. And that's an artistic version of it, but just breaking up shapes into, um, like I said, into the shapes that are required for uh, making the piece happen is part of it too. Cause something that's not necessarily inherently more artistic or altering this alters the piece, but on a piece like this, which is a, a memento mori piece I did that's available on my website, it doesn't really change the skull art. The art was there and it doesn't really change it, it entirely or change the look that much. When I have a fully outlined piece like this that has details for me to do what I did do, which is to carve apart, to break apart the jawbone into a length limit satin, to have the teeth as satins, to have this satin ridge for the, uh, for the cheekbone and the eye, the kind of ridge around the uh, brow ridge, to have this curved fill for the vault of the head, to have a curved fill for the back of the head as well. These pieces being carved into separate elements, yes, it adds visual interest, but it doesn't change the art. So between the two, this version with the Zozobra changes the art. This piece over here, it enhances the art without really making a, a drastic change. Whereas you might say that this piece, this Zozobra piece is a more of a drastic change to the art and it's more in the carving style. Uh, similarly here, when we look at this piece from Mud Volleyball, uh, I split up this mud into the base here. This is our, our fill stitch base. And we have satin stitches that are used to carve into this splashing mud. This doesn't vastly change the art of the mud. The shapes aren't changed. It's not enhancing it that much. It's just adding a textural piece to it. Same thing with the volleyball. Instead of doing one big flat fill, each of the panels has a length limit or auto split satin that follows uh, the stitch angle, follows the curvature of the panel so that as you move the light across it, it changes the overall look. But that doesn't change the art that much. Whereas something like Zazobri here, it, uh, when you have a, a plain flat silhouette and you change it, it does change the art somewhat. But that's carving and that's one of the things we can do with interpretation, right? Shape or carving. How do we break up the, the flat planes, the continuous planes of color and draw something different out of them? Layering and sequencing. How do we layer them? Are, are certain things in front or behind and how does that enhance the look or the depth of the piece? Combination and contrast, like I showed you earlier, do we have different stitch types next to each other? As we saw in that carved example of the mud, do we have satins next to fills? Do we have different textures or different angles of fill next to each other so that we get something that has some contrast, that has different combinations of either stitch types or textures that sets it apart visually? Uh, placement, where where is the actual piece placed or where are the elements placed in it? But then we have things that are really in the settings camp, right? We were in the interpretation camp. Now we're in the settings camp. This is where we get into stitch types and settings. This is where we get into variables on the individual stitches. Variables, right? So things like stitch type, that is a variable to a degree. So what kind of stitches are we filling an area with? Uh, the stitch length and the stitch pattern for each type of piece. So what sort of stitch lengths are we using? Are we using a regular or a randomized stitch length? Are they longer or shorter? And what does that do to the overall piece? Like I always say, long, regular stitches are shinier. Shorter, irregular stitches are going to be a little less shiny, look rougher and more pebbly or more organic. Uh, especially irregular is organic. Uh, more regular is going to be more mechanical, more shiny, more smooth. Uh, things like density, how much density do we have? How close together are details or lines of stitching? Whether that is in our fill stitches as a setting or variable or in drawing, how close together have we drawn lines? And then of course we have things like stitch angle. And this is not just the angle of the piece, but do we use curvature or angles? When we break things up, like I said, with combination and contrast, are the stitch angles varied as we go from piece to piece? As we go from element to element, do we vary our stitch angles? And I think that's another thing that I, I do talk about a bit. That's part of our planning. And, and honestly, I'll go ahead and put bring this piece out. Um, this is a Viking age style horse piece that was done from a bronze plate. 
the original was uh, certainly very much flatter. It was a flat aspect. When I decided to make this piece, I thought, all right, we're going to do a little bit with the controls of this piece to change it. Uh, we have some variation in stitch type. We've got satin stitches next to fill stitches. So we have these ridges of shiny satins right next to a fill, but we have the curvature of the fill. And as we can see into the back, this is the same color from the back to the neck area. The neck has one curve and next to it, we have a different angle that's offset between the two pieces to give it some textural variation and give it a different play of light. So we have contrast between stitch type and stitch angle. And in each one of these pieces, if we look at these two fills here, we have a curved fill here. And in this piece, we have a different curve here. These both have a regular pattern. They look very smooth because there's regular offsets of the stitches from line to line so that they don't end up breaking in a pattern that has you know much more texture to it. So there's that. Each one of these things kind of comes together to change the overall look. So we have that stitch length, stitch pattern. We have density. These are full density. So these are probably right around that four point because this is 40 weight thread. So four points are 0.4 millimeters uh, uh, overall density in the individual pieces. And what we have is a not only a regular pattern, but we have a fairly long stitch length. We got a fair amount of shine here. These are uh, four plus millimeter stitches as well in each of these fills. So those are the kind of things that we can change in those fills. So we've got the stitch angle, we have the density, we have stitch length and patterns. So that's part of it as well as stitch types. And as you can see, what do we have? Combination and contrast. We have layering and sequence. We have certain things that are on top of other things. Now with everything outlined, it's less critical, but we do have satin borders that are up on top of other elements so that they stand up forward from them. We have that kind of layering done and junctions are done in a way that is kind of intelligent to the concept of things being over and under the tail is below the leg this this leg here is underneath the upper leg with everything separated and outlined in colors uh, the true layering versus the sense of the layering is not as critical but we can see that how that combination and contrast and how the different settings make a difference curved fill the light's going to follow that curve you see how we have kind of a shadow toward the back end of it because that light is coming from this angle here it's shining differently here than it is here and because of this angle in the back, the stitch angle, we have a really high shine, even though these are the same color thread. That is one contiguous piece of thread through the inside of the legs, as well as the back neck and the, the mid sections of the face in the horse. Uh, the only difference we have that's creating this massive color variation is the angle of the thread and how that's being played on by the angle of the light. So these are the things we kind of think about with our settings. Uh, other things we have, of course, obviously are material concerns. We're not going to talk about those much today specifically, but it's stuff that I just want to bring up, of course. Um, we can select the color of our thread, the color of our materials, the color of our fabrics. Now, certainly lots of this is going to be set for us. If we're commercial digitizers, somebody is bringing us art, bringing us the pieces, and that's all we can do is kind of work from there. Uh, so that's one of those things, right? Uh, so that color overall is going to be part of something that is set for us, but we do still have kind of a set, especially we're doing something like, like uh, gradations or we're doing shading. We do also kind of set the colors and help to set exactly what tones we use in any range of color, even if someone brings us their actual piece and wants color matching. A thread choice, obviously, 60 weight thread is going to give you finer ability to do detail than 40 weight thread. However, 60 weight thread has to be treated differently. And on textured materials, you may have to watch your stitch lengths, even though you can technically go with smaller stitch lengths. And you are going to have to increase density to get coverage. But thread choice changes, and especially we start going into thick threads, furry threads, or even uh, matte finish threads. We actually have a lot to, we can do with finish and light with those. And of course, applied materials like applique or special effects like adding sublimation to something. These are all things that we can do to add uh, an extra enhanced version of color or shading or print or pattern any of these things can be altered through special effects or applied materials. We can also use textured materials or different kinds of printed materials for applique that allow us to have a lot more visual impact or to do something different with that impact than we would do just in our embroidery, just in our digitizing. So those are more material kind of thoughts, right? In this case, most of what we're going to talk about today is more about settings and variables. Obviously, interpretation is huge. Shape and carving is huge because really these go hand in hand interpretation, the shapes we draw, the order in which we put things, and how we contrast things that are close together, that are adjacent, massively changes the look. 
Uh, we add those to those variables that we understand as far as stitch type, stitch length and pattern, density, stitch angle, and of course, things like underlay, which is going to help us get uh, more loft, more lift, more color coverage. Those are, are partially technical, but can be aesthetic as well. However, the rest of these things, especially type, length and pattern, density and angle, that's the stuff that's going to really change the look of our piece when combined with how we break things apart, how we carve them, how we draw the shapes we need. Like I said, <laughs> seems like a lot of stuff. I, I saw this already. Kay says, uh, my list of things to practice is getting longer and longer. Practice a project. Don't try and practice every single piece of this thing. By all means, grab a project and kind of figure that stuff out on the project level. Uh, that's why I do things like that horse. This horse was done as a stock design for myself because uh, I felt like it. There's another one that I did recently, and I'm going to show you a little bit of, and we'll see if I can get this on camera without breaking everything. Um, this is a piece I'm actually going to show you a little bit of. This is another one of the kind of Viking Age pieces that I do. It's one of those classic kind of two color pieces. It's not showing awesome on camera, but you can see how there's some different fill stitch textures in this. There's some satin stitches. There's some straight stitches. The fabric I ran it on was kind of a, a poor choice, so it's not looking the best that it could. But you can see where even in two colors, we're getting a fair amount of interest out of patterning, out of stitch types, out of angles. And you can see how the different angles change that play of light, even under kind of uh, super hot studio style lighting. We're still seeing how stitch angles and how types and textures play with that stuff. Thing is, try it on a project. Do something you want to do. Break, break up one piece. Do a two color piece, a, a simple piece and see how that works for you and play with it. You're gonna build up this kind of set up of settings, this palette of settings and stitch types and things that you understand how they work and you'll be able to employ them in any work as you go forward. Uh, rather than practicing everything, uh, do some self-directed projects and at least it will get you kind of that win of making a thing that is interesting to you that you'll be able to work with. So something worthwhile. Uh, also, let's see. Uh, Ballpark of objects, Lisa. I'll have to look that up for you because it was done in other software. I don't have it open right now. But yeah, it's not a ton of objects. It's not as many as you might think, but it's more objects than, you know, standard fills on that on the mouse. Um, I'll have to check it out. <laughs> like I said, yeah, I've slept since then. Uh, what I will say is that when we're looking at the number of objects that are in this piece, and I'll, I'll pop that back up. What I can tell you is that I do use more objects than most people. There's that back up there. We see that like each of the toes in that leg is a separate object. So there's three satins in that toe. That's a fourth satin for this leg. Couple, there's three or two toes that are visible on this one. And that's another satin. So we've already got five objects. There's one fill, another fill, seven objects. You know what I mean? We start, if you look at this, each one of these carved pieces is another object, which means I did have to draw the out, outside edges of this object. If I were trying to just make there be this color in this space, you could technically probably break some of these. This could be like one big chunk of satin with maybe one extra on here instead of four. But I just don't see that the uh, look is, is that that much of a problem. You know what I mean? Like the look is worth that many objects to me. Let's put it that way. And if we look at this piece, we do have a manual stitch for that first shading area. But if we look at this, that's one fill, two fills. There's one more manual and another fill. So that whole area that was done up to this point, that is really only like two manual objects and three fills. If I look at how many points I would have had to draw to make an entire fill for the whole area, it's not much more. I mean, let's put it that way. I've got one more fill in here as well. So I've got, like I said, one big fill, one in the middle, one for the face, one for the uh, shoulder, and a three, couple little pieces of objects. And so what I would say is like a couple of pieces of manual that are done as separate objects. I could have done manual here, manual here, and then one big fill. But for the price of drawing this little piece in the edge of this little piece here to separate these areas for the price of those 15 more control points or nodes, I think it is well worth it to get the texture. Same thing here. If we look at this fill, that is like one fill, two fills, uh, manual. So there's three objects and then the outlining. Outlining, you know, outlining takes a lot of uh, control points. No matter what I do, I would have had to do that whether I was doing the rest of those things as solid fills. And if we look at it here, this is all manual work. So that's pretty much one object, but it took a lot more clicking. And then we have a fill here in the background and then one more uh, manual run on top of it. So really, yes, it's a lot of objects, but if we think about what we would have had to draw anyway, you're probably adding maybe four or five objects to this whole stack to make that happen. 
So I would say, yes, you're going to draw more objects to get more texture out of things. In fact, if you think about that, uh, that kind of case, what I would actually say is something that looks much simpler. Uh, if we look at, let's say, that Zobra piece that I showed you earlier, let's bring that back up on screen because we've got the ability to do so. Um, if we start looking at something like this is over piece, this one has tons more objects than the original because the original piece, if I brought this in from vector and didn't care about, let's say too much about the pull conversation, and everything else. And I didn't care about the fact that the texture was going to look very bland. I probably could have made this one big object. Whereas if we look at it again, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 objects to make the flames at the bottom instead of one. Does this take more drawing? Yes, it does. What I'm going to tell you is we did a ton more jackets after they saw this little guy, jackets and hats together, actually. We did a ton of them uh, because they liked that texture and it was a much better looking piece than I would have voted on this as a fill. Also, the thing that's going to surprise a lot of folks, this piece right here with all these split satins and all those objects is less stitch count than if I had made this as one complex fill, especially when we consider all these little insets and everything else that's going on inside of these uh, the bottom of this these uh, flames if we let the software calculate this it's going to fill some portion of it travel back fill more travel back fill more go up to the top fill some go up to the top here fill some more and eventually it'll keep filling and filling and filling it'll get up to this middle section try and fill this go back out to the fingers fill these areas come back fill this fill this if it's all at one stitch angle and all fill we're going to have a tremendous number of travel runs that the software has to create in order to move out to the edges and calculate and fill the rest of this stitching in. In order for that to work, it's going to have to do a lot of traveling all of its own. So yes, there's more objects. And then there's certainly things like this. We have uh, this flying monkey patch. Absolutely. Is there a ton more objects in creating the individual feathers on this? Absolutely it is. I think that, uh, once again, the visual appeal of this piece is much better than a piece that wasn't done that way. You could make this one solid fill. Um, as it traveled into all these little fine points that are really not well suited to a fill, you could have allowed it to be one. Um, you're going to get a ton of traveling in and out, but especially on something like this that has a lot of deep insets and cuts and shapes that are involved, there is a non-trivial amount of traveling that any software has to do. But yeah, thank you for asking that. So so, let, so I would say, uh, Lisa, thank you for asking that. See some other folks who are in there too. Uh, so Lisa says, we can uh, we can say, Eric says, don't be afraid of creating many objects you need to get the look you want. Absolutely. And in fact, expect to create those objects. Expect to create the rest of those objects. Expect to create more objects than you actually see on screen in your art. It is a granted thing that you will create those objects. Um, so yeah, something something worthwhile to say. Now what I'm gonna do real quickly, I am gonna share some of uh, the presentation that I'm currently doing. So this is the piece that I'm currently out there touring right now. And let me uh, back, out, back this out a little bit so you can actually see it and we'll take off the channel bug so you guys can get that out of the way. This is a portion of, of a class that I'm teaching right now about selecting and configuring stitch types. I'm going to run through some of these elements kind of quickly just to show you. Satin stitches, you know they have high shine and shadow because of the crests of the satin stitches, the crown being high, they're unbroken, so they're nice and shiny. I always call it free shading because the edges have shadow. If we look at this carved uh, lion wing here with his winged lion, all these little shadows, all the differences in shading. Here's our contrast. Here's our, our kind of adjacent stitch angles. All of that is in the free shading. But here's the stuff that we can change about satin stitches. How dense are they? What angle are they at? What kind of splits can we create and count? And these are the things I wanted to talk about. What do we change about satin stitches? These are the things. How dense? So how close together the stitches? What angle are they at? Or are they turning in multiple angles? Generally, when we do a satin stitch, this is a turning angle. We can see that I'm turning into different angles as I proceed through this wing. We can see my old cursor going through there. Uh, we can talk about splitting. How do we either allow it to auto split like a length limit or do we split the satins to get a textured line or a split line on purpose? Um, those are all things that we can do. And the count, the count being how many times does the bar, we know a satin stitch is a bar that is perpendicular across the, the column of satins and then an angled return line for satins, right? We know that's how they work. And then they go back across perpendicular or at least on the angle that we have set for that satin column. It goes across on the angle and an angled return to the other side. Count is how many times do we stitch like a bean stitch, odd numbers, 
across that bar before we move on. And that's what we often call a whip stitch in, in the world of stitch artists. Um, that's something we can change too. So these are all the things we do, but look at these different things we can change. Angle. If we look at the way light plays on, if you saw my pixel art articles, if you saw the pixel art um, session that we did here for the take up, varying angle from piece to piece from the things that are adjacent vastly changes the perception of color. There are this little pixel piece where we have 90 degree changes between each side. These pixels up here in the upper left, those are the same color blue, but they are vastly different in their look because of the stitch angle. Uh, we can also see that when we're talking about angle and density here, we have these turning angles in this piece and we can use stitch angle to feather into other, other types of stitches. This is actually a back stitch up here. We're probably not going to get into line stitching because we're so far along today. Probably just do the big four, like uh, fill satin straight stitch, uh, you know, and manual. We'll probably just talk about those today, but you can see how we can tip that angle on that satin. This is done in the big uh, 12 weight Burmalana wool blend thread. I'm tilting that satin angle until I get to a point where I can then uh, get into this back stitch, which is a, more of a line type stitching. And then we can do things like look at splitting. This is an auto or length limit split that has a nice edge pad on it. And this was done for a technical reason. This is done to make a more durable letter on the back of a jacket where someone might scrape it or snag it. But that splitting is auto splitting, which you can see isn't split exactly down the line it's done in such a way that it creates a texture that is more smooth a regular split and we can see it like that length limit stitching we get that smooth split by having a, a, a higher edge pad number or minimum stitch length and that gives us a, a more satin type edge but that split is not as obvious as a true split true split satins will have a carved line so these are the things we can change about satins right but then we have count count or whip stitch. I've talked about this before too. This one is done in a more distressed fashion. The thing to notice about this is this R was drawn in the same way. These are the same essentially vector, the same digitizing shapes from the left to the right. And they are exactly the same stitch count or close to it. I actually adjusted my densities until I had the same stitch count from the left to the right. And this is done by increasing the count. We have a single count satin on the left. We have a, I believe a three or a five count and then a seven count over here on the right. And that means that every time we hit that straight bar across that matches the angle we set for our satin stitch, that we go multiple times in one spot before we move over to the next slot. And you can see how that looks. On the bottom here, we have a matte finish thread that runs a little thinner. This is a polyester matte finish thread. And as we can see, we can see the divisions a little bit better because it does run a little thinner and doesn't have the shine that kind of uh, you know, obfuscates, kind of hides that split. But we can see that that multiple count makes for a very different look. Now, these ones are also uh, semi-distressed by using edge quality. We see that edge quality shown here. It's something that you can also see with uh, fill stitches. This one on the right-hand side on both top and bottom, top is a rayon thread, bottom is that polyester matte finish has a little bit of feathering or jaggedness added to it to make it look more distressed. And the fun thing about this is this is one case where it's not about our drawing. This particular piece, this these pieces are drawn exactly the same. That is the same shape, a stock lettering type that you can get from, from our software, right? Uh, this is one called Stymy Black that I digitized myself and drew myself. Um, this particular piece, from the left to the right, that is the same set of vectors. And all we're changing is uh, count, density, and a little bit of edge quality. So these are the things we can configure about satins. But look at how different the look is from the left to the right. That is an immense difference in look. If we understand uh, both how the angle looks, if we think back on our little pixel friend, how much angle can change things and the contrast between stitch angles. If we think about things like splitting and how much we can alter textures, though there is some drawing involved, as you can see this acanthus style piece, I separated each one of these leaflets in this compound shape into their own satin. We can see one big satin here that goes up into these individually carved satins. You can also see how they're layered. This one goes down first, then the one on the left side then this one on the right side, then the one on the left continues and fills and finishes the stem. So the layering is part of this setup to show the, the depth of the piece and it makes it look more organic. It is layered in a way that makes sense for a floral piece like this, for this foliate, these leaf shapes. 
And we can see how it's the edge padding and the split pattern that changes the way this looks. Because this has a randomized or a length limit style split, we don't have those smooth or those really, not smooth, but these really sharp gutters that are created when you use a traditional split, uh, split satin. And you can see this here. Uh, this is actually a piece that's directly from uh, from Arrow. His Arrow Postal made this piece. Sometimes I do that retail research. And this is one that I saw and I was kind of shocked because I saw a traditional kind of craft style split satin sitting out there in a major high store, in a, in a fashion store, in, the, in a regular kind of retail serious setup where you expect maybe less of these textures. I saw that split satin that has those nice, big, deep grooves in it. So a traditional satin gets a deep, regular groove and that changes that texture. So all of these things can change. Density, angle, splitting, count, and edge quality. Also, not listed here, underlay. The difference in the underlay can change both edge quality and our color coverage in these pieces. So those are things we can play with. How dense is it? What kind of split do we have? What kind of angle? What kind of count? What kind of edge quality? That's satin stitches. And in fact, if we look at something that has a little more distressing, something that we intentionally worked on, I'll actually show you something else. This is a piece that I often show. Knob Hill Bar and Grill. And this actually is a piece that we did for them, a distressed rough cut applique. It was on the hip of some garments. But the thing is, you might think that I've got a lot of weird manually placed stitches in this. None of these are manual. This is all settings. Uh, the only thing that's interesting about this piece that's not entirely manual is we look at this gray edge that is here underneath everything. That gray edge is using a custom split stitch motif that I did. Everything else is settings, right? If we look in the center, these are whip stitch or multi-count satins with a lower density. They are at the same density as full coverage would be, but because of the multiple counts where we're dropping the uh, points on each of these whip stitches all in the same place, we end up with a very split kind of look. We have underlay that's actually showing a little sparkle underneath it and holding it up and providing some coverage. But we have this very distinct split rough look because we're using a multi-count satin stitch. Um, though we haven't talked about it yet, we can see that we have fill stitches in the background. You see the regular pattern that's there. They look a little rough or a little more open because we have really loose. The gray fill has a really low density. The maroon fill has a, has a very low density also, not as low as the gray because the gray is just almost there for texture alone just to provide a small amount of shading and some directional lines on top of what is a gray jersey knit uh, applique. And what we see here, these big, thick stitches that look like some sort of weird manual stitching, this is a massive bean stitch. Each one of these lines is just one plotted bean stitch line. However, this is, I believe, a uh, nine count bean, huge bean stitches. They make a real big penetration point and really huge shadows because each one of these stitches goes back and forth nine times. So this is bean stitching. This is regular fill stitch blocks. This is regular satin stitch shapes this could this shape here can be taken directly from any of the rest of their logo work however the density was altered and the count was altered so all of this different texture that we're getting out of these pieces none of this is done manually none of it needed necessarily a ton more work if we think about the way these letters are broken up individual strokes this is exactly how you would break up these letters for any other logo so in this case it's really about composition and it's about settings. That's a variable setup. That's one where the variables really are doing the work for you because really there's nothing else about that that is vastly different than you would do in digitizing those letters for any other sort of presentation. The shapes were already done in that way. It's really about the variables in this particular setup. So that's that's something to think about is that sometimes the variables can carry a lot for you. It just depends on what you're trying to do with them. So once again, satins, uh, and we'll just pull me out of the uh, frame here. Density, angle, splitting, count, and edge quality. Those are things we can configure about satin stitches. Uh, one other thing I showed you for count, this is another piece where the carving does matter a little bit. This is a piece I did for testing the whip stitches. Uh, and this is actually a, a carved kind of beveled multiple piece uh, monogram. And actually I have this piece and we'll go ahead and show this to you in a second. I have this piece where we can take a look at it, but we can see is count also being used here for a multi-count piece. And it looks very much like hand work, but it is only a little bit of carving, a little bit of separation that makes the difference in this particular piece. It's not all that much as far as what we're looking at compared to uh, creating this monogram separately. And I'll go ahead and bring this up for you in software. This is done in Stitch Artist. And we can see that up here, as, as simple as this piece looks, that's that's really all there is to it. It's got a few shapes. So we look at the objects. 
there are, it is carved into two columns, each one of the strokes. So we have two columns in the bottom. Travel run here just to travel up to the next piece. Two columns into the loop, two columns in the tail. And then we have a run stitch. And this actually, the run type on this stitch is a back stitch that's done around the outside edge. And we get all that texture from it. So if we go back to the piece, this is the piece we're looking at. That's what it actually looked like. This is in a spun polyester. So it's got a little bit of texture to it, a little bit of fuzz. It looks more like a floss or something that would be more like a cotton thread, but it's not. It's a polyester, spun polyester thread. But if we look at the actual piece, we can run through it and show you how this runs. We've got a multi count satin. So as we go, each one of these bars has a triple count. So three counts and then an angle return, then triple count, angle return, triple count. We go ahead and grab that and I can, I can confirm that too. If we jump over here, we can see that this is a three pass whip down here at the bottom with a density of seven points. Nice open density because we're using that three pass whip, which is going to increase the overall coverage and density. But seven points is the, the nominal density of the lines that are drawn in, right? Stitch length on this is four mils. We've got a little edge pad in it to keep it there. And we've got a pattern on the reverse. And that's all in Stitch Artist. These, these settings will differ depending on which software you're in. But we can see that we actually carve each one of those strokes with a little bit of a transit out of two uh, columns of stitching. The two columns layer together on top of each other. And that's how we get the extra little line of texture in the middle. And it ends up with that kind of heavier uh, setup than we would with a traditional split. We end up with some overlapping, which makes it stand up a little bit more like a bevel. And then on the outer edge, we actually have that back stitch. And we can see if we kind of watch that point going back and forth. Back stitches will jump forward and then kind of overlap a little bit with a multi stitch segment. We're not going to cover a bunch of that today, but we can see that the back stitch does provide additional texture. So this piece, though it seems kind of complicated when we're looking at the actual final piece, um, the actual piece that's there looks more complicated than it is. It only takes a little bit of carving to make the difference. And understanding how that multi-pass affects the density allows us to create a coverage that we're happy with. So this is all kind of the stuff we can see with those sorts of stitch ties, with satin stitches. Let's pop up our fill stitches for a second just to talk about it. Uh, once again, I'm not going to cover everything that's in my class, but we'll go through these the big four here. Uh, fill stitches are great for large flat surfaces like doors or body panels. This is an old, old piece of mine where I did the one of these little sprint cars, uh, midget sprint cars. And you can see that we have fill stitches being used for the large body panels that are of broken different angles. Uh, so very simple piece, unbroken areas of color, even into the tires and things. I could have done some more texture on this piece, but largely this is done with fill stitches. And this is previous to me having curved fills. One of the reasons I put this into my slide deck is people rightfully say that I use a lot of curved fills. If you're lucky and you're a stitch artist user, those come with uh, your initial your initial stitch artist setup. Whereas um, if you are someone who's using other software, some software, it, it requires an additional add-on. Um, it depends on your software, whether or not curved fills are there for you. But what I'm going to show you is this piece was done on one of my older software setups that did not have curved fills. So even just by varying the stitch angles, from piece to piece, I'm still getting some uh, dynamic color transitions. And you can see how this looks like I've got a different blue in the helmet than I do in the uh, front of this piece. And that is all stitch angle. This is the same blue across the entire piece. Um, I did not use multiple blues to shade that. That is the same blue across and it's stitch angle that's making the difference. This is back when I'm on, you have to remember, I started out on six and nine needle machines too. So I didn't have a lot of colors to work with. So commercial pieces, uh, dimensionally our angles largely are set to control kind of how light plays on the surface. We can see on this boom from this crane, we've got vertical angle going into a shallow horizontal angle underneath it. Uh, we, we depict separations on the object seams edges by changing stitch angles. And then we can use layered light density fills to do things like shading. This is multiple light density fills, as we can see, not going to go over building gradients that much, but just to show you that when we have this three color fill, what well, we actually have are four objects in each one of these layers. So we have a grand total of 12 objects here that make up this one F because each one is a layer of quarter density fill. So what's the thing we're looking at here? If we look at this piece in art, that is one big slab of gradient filled color. If we look at what we need for embroidery, once again, we got to break it up into multiple shapes. And that is a technical reason, not necessarily an aesthetic reason, because I'm not changing or varying stitch angle. And in fact, for blending, stitch angles all have to be the same throughout for things to blend. 
So as we can see here, each one of these is actually four objects in each color to end up creating that kind of smooth blend. And I have to work on my patterning to make that work, right? So that smooth blend is actually each one of these pieces has 12 objects in it. So once again, is this for everybody? No. Why are people buying color reel machines that cost 30 grand and dye the thread on top of your machine? Well, this is why. Because as a digitizer, this takes a tremendous amount of time and skill. Uh, as someone using a color reel machine, it's a lot less, even though there's still some uh, hangups to making that work in digitizing. Uh, having somebody dye that instead or sublimate it later is a lot easier than doing this. But the thing to remember, total control, total responsibility. If you want to do this, you absolutely can. Or you can do it manually like I showed you with the multicolor gradient. And you can absolutely make a gradient happen because all we're doing is interlayering multiple colors until we blend, just like we were drawing with a pen. If we were drawing with a marker with a pen, right? We're not the marker because you could blend that, but this is not ink. If you were if we were drawing out lines, we were laying out sticks in colors till we got to our uh, our densities we wanted, that's what we'd be doing here. And, but like we can show you before, different fill stitch types. We have our curved fills here. We have our density that changes to do some of this shading, but matching the angles makes things lay into each other. But if we look at most of the shading that's done here in these wolves, we have a little bit of manual work around the edges in the face, a little bit of manual work in the ears, around the nose. All of these areas have some manual work, but the rest of these, this shading is multiple layers of lower density fill laid in. We have holes in the underlying blue here that allow me to lay in this full density light blue on top of the medium blue. And all of that essentially is done with fill stitches. The only this part where you can see that the angles vary a great deal and we have multiple different angles kind of happening in the same course of stitches. Is it not a fill? The rest of these are big curved fills and you can even see some imperfections when you get up close. There is traveling happening on the edge of the fill in the main body of this wolf. But when you look at this piece from further away, you don't see it. But for fill stitches, what are the things that we can configure on a fill stitch? Once again, we have density, how close together these elements are. That's always something we do there. We have angle or curvature, uh, but you can also use that for multiple different things. It's not just getting that stitch angle for, um, for the sense of changing those angles like i showed you in the horse to get contrast you can also use multiple angles and light densities to create uh kind of interference patterns we have this piece here which is a monogram on a faux ostrich purse that i did and you can see that it is done with multiple layers of light density fill that are artistically placed so that where the angles cross in the elements we get darker areas and weird kind of patterns of interference so there are also aesthetics things we can do that aren't about the play of light. They're more about using the fill stitch as a method of placing lines. Even though these are also individually outlined, these blocks, the pattern and angle here, it, it really is more about the line value rather than the reflection of light as far as that background in in this monogram piece. So angle and curve can be messed with. We can talk about that as far as that horse. Again, we do have the, the curvature changing, the contrast between the blocks. Then we have texture, certainly. And I, like I said before, you see some of my more detailed pieces this is the carousel horse I often bring out. We've got a different curve in the neck as we have in the uh, upper face, in the mid face, in the nose. So instead of one big object for all of this white that's in this horse's head, what we actually have are several objects. Certainly you can see the carved satins and length limit split satins that are in the neck, but we have an object here. We have multiple objects, three or four objects in this area of the head. And then we have the nose the upper nose area, the mid face, the jaw are in separate fills that are layered from furthest away to us to closest to us so that we get this variation in angle and texture in light as we move across the surface. Is it easier to have one big piece of the horse? Perhaps uh, does it make a better embroidery? Absolutely not. Other things we can uh, configure, we have texture. Part of the way we configure texture is through the pattern. Now, not all software has manual control over this. Some does, some doesn't. But we can see this is a, a standard, standard uh, piece of fill stitch. This is a standard tatami pattern. What we can see about this tatami pattern, if we break it down and look at it, each of them, these kind of circles represents a penetration point. These are four lines of stitching in a fill stitch. Imagine that we have a four millimeter stitch length that we set. What you're going to notice is on a standard tatami pattern that we have an offset that is a standard percentage. We have 25% movement each time. So one millimeter over for this one, one millimeter over, one millimeter over. That is a standard regular fill pattern and it only repeats every four lines. 
So what we end up with here is a pattern because of these regular offsets that looks shinier, more regular, more flat. Whereas we can use randomness to make the texture look more organic. And we can also change things like the actual pattern to use carved patterns uh, in the piece itself that have a texture to them that's specific, like herring bones or snake scales or any of the fun stuff. Something that you're not going to see a lot of when it comes to um, when it comes to traditional logo work. You're probably not gonna see basket fills and things like that. I've used them a couple times in my play pieces. Not really something I do a lot, pattern fills, but more in the craft and decor side, people use them much more. What I have done is a lot of custom carving. You can add your own custom carving lines, and I've used that for all manner of textures from making even very regular lines like a standard fill in a blend to specifically trying to make um, textured looks in different pieces, specifically trying to bring out lines and textures in art. So one of the things we can change the texture is pattern. So the texture is both regularity and the pattern. So these are the things about the texture we can change. Stitch length, the longer it is, the more it's going to be shiny, the shorter, it's more pebbly, the more rough and look. Offset or offsets, like I said here, the offsets from stitch to stitch. Regularity, is it randomized or is it regular? And then can, we can use like other kinds of patterns. And this is something that I've, I've done from the very beginning of me uh, creating an embroidery. This is one of my very earliest pieces of software that I used. I made this swatch, it was FS1, what does that mean? A uh, fill stitch one, me showing the patterns that were built into the software. And then I made tons of these swatches. They were hanging all over my office so that I could see exactly what fill stitch settings would do. I'm not saying you need to do that. For me, this is the way I got my head around that kind of quality. And if you were here watching the vintage piece that I did, the vintage episode, I talk about this null pattern that was used by the folks over at Super Dry. This is a standard satin style pattern that has no offsets set to it. And it just echoes in the stitch length from the edges. You can see how texture and fill stitch repeat really makes a difference. Uh, standard tatami repeat looks very flat. If we use something like the null or the satin pattern, we get this echoed in stitch length that gives us these big heavy patterns, but these are the same shapes. So we have to understand that that's where that setting that repeat, setting that texture makes a big difference to the look. The same shape in that sun provides the, these two different textures. Like I said before, length equals shine. Also being unbroken. Satin stitches being unbroken all lined up are shinier than fills. And a regular fill is shinier than a textured fill. We see this one's very regular, very shiny on the horse. We can see here in this Law Tigers piece that I often show that we have a roughness to this, the face. First thing I'm gonna tell you is this is carved into three panels. There's one panel for the eye. There is another panel on the other side and one panel for the nose and the top of the head in this orange fill. However, why does it look kind of rough? Why does it look more organic? randomization, setting the randomization to 50% massively changes the look. Random fill stitch links, even in a geometric piece, adding randomness to it. This very geometric 1970s thick line style piece done for Alamo Navajo School Board looks much more organic by setting a randomness to the fill stitch pattern. Also edge quality, feathering, right? Same thing that's done here in satin style shading is done here at the edge of the mouse that you saw earlier. I talked about feathering or jaggedness to the edge settings makes a difference to edge quality. And it can be done both with satins and fills. In this case, on the top is a satin column and we can set the percentage of jaggedness as well as extension. As we go here, we're, we're seeing it go from one-sided jaggedness or feathering at 20% 20 20 uh, jaggedness, 20% extension. And here it goes 20, 20 on both sides. And here on this right-hand column is 40 and 40. So we're not gonna get into line defining stitch types today for sure. It's something to think about, but these are just kind of things I want you to get around is that even in the big four, in the, in the simple stitch types that we use all the time, we have all this variation that we're capable of. That's just in the settings. And if we think about that in relation to what we can do for drawing, what we can do with carving, there's a tremendous amount of work that we can get out of our settings and out of our stitch types. And I'm going to show you a couple other pieces that we have kind of here to, to bring up as far as like, um, you guys kind of, I show you the things that I work on, some of the stuff that I've got. I showed you this little raven piece, which is like a shield mount that's kind of interesting. And you can see some textures and you can even see in the neck there, do you see that there's actually a textured fill, something I don't often do that it, I thought that that kind of couching pattern looked very interesting, that quilting kind of pattern. 
but I'm going to go ahead and show you that piece and run through it real quick. And then we're probably going to cut this one off pretty soon here. I have to admit I'm tiring out a little bit since I've been ill, but I'm a little more tired than I used to be <laughs> a little quicker. I'm starting to get back there, but I'm still at about 85%. You can see though, there are lots of objects. Um, the original lines here are just part of vector. Those are not part of the drawing. Uh, part of the original art, but the rest of these columns, you can see there's lots of objects here. Um, aside from the first about, you know, 30 odd pieces that we have, or 130 objects actually that are in this, in the art, we do have another, you know, 70 odd elements that we're putting together to create this final piece. But let's go ahead and run through it really quick. And I can show you just briefly how we end up with, even on a simple piece, we get some texture, some variation, some shine. And funny enough, I think actually zoomed out, you see the shine and the light playing over this better than you do <laughs> zoomed in um, because of how the light's working on my camera here. But I just wanna show you this piece this is a simple piece I did for myself just to play around with some settings. But what we're gonna see is I've got some decent underlay on this piece because I want this to stand up pretty high. I've got an edge run plus kind of a double zig. So a contour. Uh, plus the two perpendiculars. So I've got overlapped satins in the tail. We go into a border that we're eventually going to have some other outlining done. This is satins again. We are carving the talon out of three satin stitches. It will get a lot more definition once I add the black border to it. And the leg is actually done in two segments. Up into the wing that has the tip of the wing has three satins creating it. We can see there's a central satin in the two edges that are overlapped meaningfully. We have that nice, uh, very much like a uh, mitered corner to that piece. Though it looks pretty loose and cut because we're going to come over this with the satin border. We then have, uh, I've done an overall underlay on this piece. Then I have the center element for the shield shape, kind of the shield shape that's on the center of the wing. There's our, our pattern fill. We can see I have a, I've got a nice mesh underlay under this piece because I'm using a very, um, a curved patterned fill in the neck. And because of those direct splits that are going to be very brick-like, I know that I'm going to see some extra show through right there. So we've got a little bit of extra show through in this piece that show through. I want to mitigate that by adding some extra stitching. I am going to say, I think this is a little too heavy density wise. I'm going to back this guy down a little bit on my next run but it does have a nice texture. We then go with our satin borders. So now I've got some contrast between the satins and the fills. And now you're gonna see the ring of fill that goes around this piece. I have a different curvature to the center than the outside of that ring, that shield shape. There is a secondary satin layer into the head. Now we see we have the smooth texture of the satin inside the eye. We go to a patterned fill right behind the beak so that we kind of have that little, uh, we echo that cushioned patterning. Then we use a nice big satin border around the head and we do another satin around the eye. So look at how much texture we have before we ever get to the outlining. We haven't done any outlining. We haven't done any shading. This is just texture, nice carved outlines. We have nice carved areas. We've got fills, fills with a curved texture. We've got uh, textures up inside of the center of the neck and in the mid phase. Then we have the final part of the bordering and you see layering. Because the wing is on top of the tail, that last border is run later than the rest of these pieces so that it intentionally layers this piece as in life. The thing that I want on top and closest to me comes later in the stack. Then we start to see our bordering. We do have one jump. That's the only jump in the piece, I believe. We got a couple, now well, there's a couple jumps. There's a jump into the eye as well. But the rest of these outlines should be connected. So we've got that jump. We have the jump into the eye. Other than that, the rest of this is all connected. We have some satins. We have straight stitches being used for outlining. We do some offset angles. There's just like the incised outlining on the original piece. There's another shield mount that I kind of stylized a little bit. Uh, the original Eagle, I believe, was actually a Frankish piece, but then I styled it after kind of the uh, Swedish um, Valkyrie pieces you may have seen me do in other episodes. Go around this back. You see that I've done an intentional... Um, mitering in that corner. The tail is done first. The wing is on top again, but in the border, we see that I've made a manual miter cut back here behind that wing. Then we go around this edge. We'll go ahead and zoom back through it again. It looks like I lost my cursor. There we go. Zoom back through it again. We get that miter cut in the back of the wing. Going around this border here, intentional mitering again on the uh, point of the beak. 
and we have another, we go into this inset and fill through and we, we overlap so that the uh, talon is on top of the body. We've got overlapping again here done intentionally so that that's on top of the body. And we finish out in the background here. And once again, the leg border finishes on top of the tail so that the leg looks like it's closer to us. So there's our piece. Once again, even in, a, in, in this two color piece, we can get a lot out of those two colors by planning ahead for layering, for textures, for stitch angle, and for looking at what contrast adjacent elements, things that touch, having a contrast in angle and texture and layering as in life, layering from the back to the front can make a big difference to how things look. So you saw that piece. I don't have a good, awesome picture of it. I will go ahead and zoom myself back in and try and give it to you on the camera one more time. Like I said, the fabric I used for this, for this initial sample was not awesome. So I'm not super happy about it. It's a little transparent, so it causes the camera to go wacky. But what we can see is as I change those angles, do we see how we're getting that light playing across that surface. That's a much livelier piece that has a lot more going on when that moves on a human person, which is everything is going to go curved on a body if it's going on garments. When it moves in the world, it's going to be a lot more interesting than one flat fill. Could I have done this piece as one flat fill in silver with a bunch of outlines? Absolutely, would have taken me a lot less time. However, that one flat fill would only have one angle of reflection with the light, meaning that on a person, all we're going to get is a shine in one direction. We're not going to get that uh, faceted look like a cut gem the way you do when you do the carving. Dimensional carving makes a big difference to that. And you'll find that even on pieces that don't necessarily have it involved, I have a tendency to add some dimensional carving into my pieces. Obviously, it's just something that I often do. Um, and something that I, I like to show because I think it is a worthwhile endeavor. Um, one of the other pieces that I show a lot, I have queued up one that I've done stitch artists. This is a piece uh, for chambers, which was a, a Netflix show. And the thing to show you is that this heart in the background is made of a lot of different textures and uh, satins. So we have satins, we have this auto splits, we have curved fills, we have randomized stitch links. And you can see this is actually a piece that was sent from me off the factory line when they were first running. They're like, oh man, Eric, this turned out great. And they were sending me snaps as it was coming off the line, right? So this is something I wasn't present for the running on this piece. This was running off of a multi-head Tajimas. Um, and this is where they started snapping the picture. But I wanted to show you, look at the difference with the stitch angle. See how this curvature in these structures, how these satin stitches have a shine to them and how it changes depending on these different looks, right? You see just from the, the light changing between, and this same piece, very same element, same sample that I have in hand here and here, we can see how different uh, the shine makes a difference to how this piece looks like it's sticking out from that surface and how these different surfaces look. And it was something that the uh, people who eventually were delivered this piece really called out and enjoyed. So it's something that's worth looking at. Is it worth doing on every piece? Maybe not, but it is something that I think is uh, worthwhile as a way to make our pieces look more interesting and better, right? So here's another check on that. I just want to show you that Chambers piece. It's one more time. I know that a lot of folks like these replays to kind of see what's going on. And this is another one where I can actually show you all the elements that are there. This is one that's done in uh, Stitch Artist Level 3. But if we look at the pieces, I will say, yes, are there lots of objects? Absolutely. That is 172 objects. I would actually say it's 171 because number object 11 is the original art. So there's our original art underneath that piece. Um, but if we want to look at this piece individually, let's go ahead and go through the entire process and I'll briefly explain it. We'll let that be the end of our, our episode today. But what we can see first, um, there's some lines there that are just part of the art that is not part of the thing. That The C and the L that you're seeing there are just some uh, vector lines where I was drawing some objects. But the first thing we see here is we've got a little stabilization run. That little uh, three spikes of thread that sews down uh, the area under the design. In the case that we were running here, we had a lightly padded jacket. It was ribbed and padded. And I just wanted to hold some of it down before I started doing the stitching. I didn't have to do a lot because it has underlay in it but I'm just gonna show it to you briefly. There's there's the first section. We have a curved fill there. We've got some uh, split. I believe we have some auto split satins going on here. Auto split satins here. So that's like some length limits actually in Stitch Artist. We've got a curved fill. Another curved fill hit a different angle. We're now filling inside of those letters. We've got another curved fill here. And we can see that we have contrast between this curvature and the curvature next to it. Curved fill up at the top. 
Another one there, once again, small overlaps in each piece. And we can see that that curvature does follow the overall shape of the anatomical heart. But in each panel, there's slight vari variations and overlaps so that we break it up and we have some uh, we have some contrast. Now we get into the length limit satins on the top. So each one of these, uh, the kind of tube-like shapes at the top are also called out. As we're building towards the elements that are closest to us, we now build in this curved fill. And what you can notice is I've used extra underlay on this top one to hold it up and to provide a little more, not only stability, but some more dimension to it. It holds it up and pushes it up to the top. We have another curved fill here. And then that tube shape that is closest to us is a nice satin. And that satin is actually unbroken. That's a solid satin without the auto splits, without the length limit, whichever your software calls it. In this case, it's a length limit. And that's because I wanted it to be shiny, unbroken, and really dimensional for it to stand up on top of all that element, all the, the elements that are in the heart. Then we have the feather points. Those are individual satin stitches layered to make that the feather, to have that texture. Then we have the central area of the uh, arrow. Then we do all the little shading and outlining on the heart because that's all in one color. We now have some uh, manually done and automatic um, outlining. So we've got some, got some auto. We have some like uh, length limit splits here in this piece. We have some length limit splits in that piece as well. But then we have some satins and you can see that I've made the border just because the border seems to be one piece doesn't mean that it shouldn't be made of multiple objects. In this case, I choose where I'm going to break it up and have some overlapping down this bottom portion. If we turn that on, you can see if I zoom in over here, we have that overlap on purpose because we have a junction here where I want this piece to be on top. Also, it allows me to take a piece that wouldn't look good as a solid satin and break it up when it gets too wide. But I do it in a way that is not automated. I do it in a way that is artistic, that adds to the overall dimension of the piece. And we can see as we fill through, we have some breaks that are left open for, for the later lettering that's going to be done. Oops. <laughs> if I don't drag my lettering into a million pieces while we're working on it. Uh, and you can see once I get through to that portion again, that all of that stuff is filled in. We've done all this border work, all that shading work. And up in the top, we are manually overlapping and doing mitering in that piece to make sure that things come out the way we want them to. And in the end, we have the individual letters. We build up the underlying revealed shadow outlines individually. And then we build up the strokes of the letters. And you can also see because of shifting in the original piece, I broke up the lettering into uh, two sets of color changes and worked center out because on this material that was shifting a bit and with this much stitching, we wanted to make sure that we had stability, right? So this piece looks a little more realistic. We can see I'm going to drop out uh, the art in this case. We don't look at that original art while we're working on it, but we can see how those textures vary, how even in the 3D preview, how the textures vary, how this unbroken satin looks higher and more dimensional. And as we get through this piece, how the contrast from element to element really does make a difference to how the dimension looks, even if we run it back with our 3D on, but we only run back the red. Before we ever get to shading or outlining, this piece has a life to it. This piece has some stability and solidity and looks dimensional before we ever move on from that piece. So without going too far into it, We'll just show that piece one more time. Here it is in the thread. Um, depending on your lighting, it's more or less exaggerated. And as you can see, because of that lighting, when we're looking at the lighting from a different angle, how much more exaggerated that big satin stitch is right in the middle and how much uh, higher it looks, how much more dimensional it looks for that. So let's wrap this up very quickly. What are the things we can control? So though we want to talk about settings and it's easy to talk about settings and variables, individual pieces, I have to stress once again, that a lot of what we're actually doing is interpretation and that it is in the shapes that we draw specific to embroidery that make the most difference that we can make the most difference on the piece by carving and working on shape. So it is in the interpretation, in our decisions that we make the most difference, even though the second portion of that, the way that we really force ourselves into more treatments, more interesting textures is to understand the variables on the stitch types. It is in our interpretation, in the drawing of shapes that I think we really make the difference as digitizers. 
though that well, like I said, there's a lot of heavy lifting we can do in the settings, but it is in the carving that makes the big the biggest difference that, as to what our interpretation, what our choices do to change that look. Layering and sequencing, of course. So shape carving, layering and sequencing, combination and contrast, when two items are close together. Changing of the angle and textures on the items that are close together will make them look different to each other and give you more visual interest and impact. Placement of elements in relation to each other. And then of course, in the settings or what I prefer to honestly call variables, the variables for each thing we're working on, we have our stitch types. So do we have unbroken ribbon-like shapes? That's a great time for satins. Do we have something big and flat that we want to be regular? That's a great time for fill stitches. Do we have lines that we're trying to fill? Now there's multiple ways we can do it with lines, but small thin lines, maybe satins, maybe we'd use our straight stitch. We have something randomized and organic, maybe manual. So we have the stitch types. Then we have stitch length and pattern. Longer stitches are going to be more shiny. They're going to look a little more, uh, the unbroken long stitches, shinier is going to stand up higher, is going to have more loft. So stitch length makes a difference. Patterning, also the regularity, especially with fill stitches, the regularity of the pattern changes how shiny, how mechanical versus how organic it is. The more randomness there is, the more organic and more rough that it looks, the more regular, the more shiny it's going to look, uh, just shinier. We have our densities, how close together are elements. Also, when we're drawing our individual outlines and shading, how close together do we draw our lines? That's also density. How close together are elements? We have our stitch angles. Like I showed you before, if you break something out up and two adjacent elements have different stitch angles, they're going to have a difference in the way that light plays over them. So that's our contrast again, our contrasting comparison between pieces. And then of course we have underlay. And beyond all of that, if we're making up our own projects and we're able to choose more of these things, or if we are helping someone to create a look, we have all of our material considerations. Uh, thread color, color of garment, thread choice, fuzzy, thin, thick, smooth, matte finish or shiny, and applied materials. We have applique, printed applique, textured appliques. We have uh, 3D foam, materials to make dimension. We have wash away materials. All those things are possible. And then we have special effects like sublimation, dyeing, cutting, fringe, all of the stuff that's then beyond the worked surfaces that are beyond what we can do in settings. But for our needs, the things to really remember are, our interpretation makes a big difference. The shapes that we see in front of us in the art aren't generally the shapes we need for embroidery and we can make a big difference to the how we draw. And in setting our variables, understand what is possible for each stitch type and what those changes do to change the surface that we're looking at, to change the reflection of light, to change the show through, the color and blending. If we understand the stitch, we can understand embroidery. With that, I'm going to go ahead and end it there. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you guys for uh, showing up. And I'm glad to have been back. We did a nice long extra bonus episode. Hopefully you guys had some enjoyment out of that. Get out there and test some things. Try some things out. Do a self-directed project. Be like me. Make a goofy Viking thing like I do just because I like it on a random day just to show some people what your software can do, what your embroidery can do. And try things out. Failure is never fatal, but it's almost always educational. And the thing that you make that doesn't turn out the way you want it to is the map to its own repair. The stitch out tells you what you need to change. And sometimes the stitch out shows you unintended consequences that can be beautiful or useful in later work. Build up your palette of settings, try things out, and go out there and uh, <laughs> ruin some fa some fabric, ruin some garments. You'll never ruin as many as people like me who've been doing it for years ahead of you. And if you do ruin something, hey, I forgive you. <laughs> it's part of the process, folks. Can't wait to see you again and to talk about embroidery again next week. <laughs>